Okay, cool. Uh, so welcome everybody to chapter number 14 of the ggplot2 with our club, book club for the DSLC. Uh, my name is Colin Berkey. I'm going to, well, you, you all know who I am. So um, we're going to talk about chapter 14 today, scales and guides. Uh, I will be a little, I'll be, a, I'll be honest with you first. Um, the chapter is not a very well-written chapter or it's still being completed. And there are some sections in there that are uh, definitely just kind of, and th they, they put the warning in the chapter. So we all know that it's just a dumping ground of, of ideas and stuff. So I, I will probably skip over quite a bit. I will also mention that there are some sections that made sense to me and other ones. I was like, I have no idea what's being talked about here. Um, and it mostly has to do with like the theory stuff. Like some of the theory stuff I think needs to be flushed out some more in this chapter. Um, some of the definitions, some of the, like, um, some of the, I'll, I'll point that out as we go on. The other, like, disclaimer that I want to say about for people that are watching this in the future and for our group is some of these notes aren't the greatest, and unfortunately, I just didn't have time to revamp them. But I did put some examples together using a different data set to hopefully highlight some of the concepts that were talked about um, in the chapter to kind of highlight them. So I will lean on the group today if I get something completely wrong, which more than likely I will, um, because I don't totally understand this chapter, please chime in, let me know, or let's work through it because this chapter, some stuff made intuitive sense, other stuff I was like, I have no idea what this is saying. So, okay, with that disclaimer, um, what we're going to kind of cover today is we're going to illustrate that there's nothing preventing you from transforming other kinds of scales beyond continuous position scales. So building a little bit beyond our scaling. So there are opportunities for us to customize it, customize our scales as much as we want based on the different aesthetic that we have, our, that, the aesthetic that we're using. Also show how concepts for position scales apply elsewhere. So we'll have this concept about like how certain aspects apply in different areas and so we'll share some examples with that. And then I'm going to try my best to discuss the theory underpinning scales and guides, but I really think the chapter needs to really focus on describing the theory and defining some of the components better, but we'll, I'll try my best really. Um, so, do you want to share your screen? Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. I thought I was sharing my screen. <laughs> Whoops. Oops. I thought I was. My bad. Share one. All right. Can people see? Number one, my desktop number one, chapter 14, scales and guides. Okay, sweet. Sorry. Yeah, so I just basically went over the learning objectives. I also talked about the chapter 14, scales and guides. Yeah, sorry, everybody. So you just saw my whole face for the intro, but that's okay. So let's talk a little bit about the theory. Uh, again, I'm leaning on the notes from the previous cohort that was doing this. Some of it's good. Some of it's just copy and paste stuff. But talking about the theory of scales and guides, each scale is a function from a region and data space to a region aesthetic space. So there's a connection in ggplot that if you have an aesthetic or you apply some data to an aesthetic, so whether that be the X, the Y, the color, the fill, so on and so forth, that, get, that gets mapped to a specific function um, in the region and the data space that's actually getting outputted to ggplot. Um, two parts of this that get talked about in the book are the access or the alleged legend. And I don't, this didn't make sense to me and somebody could probably further explain this to me, but I understood the differences between access and legends and the differences between the two and that legends require more properties, but I didn't understand what they were saying by inverse function. Like they mentioned something about like this being the inverse function of something. And that didn't make sense to me. And I didn't, I wanted to first, I know this is, I'm moving up to the group right away, but did anybody understand what they were saying there? Yeah, I think this is really confusing because they keep using the word function, which makes it sound like there's math going on. Um, and while there might be math going on when they're mapping from the data space to the aesthetic space, there's not when they're, quote, mapping back. But it's just what they say. It allows you to convert visual properties back to data. So like it's it's not anything formal. I think it just basically means that under the hood, there was a transformation from the data to the aesthetics. And now you as the viewer need to be able to understand how to map what you're seeing back to what it actually means. 
Yeah, that's 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 a great explanation, Kyle. Like, I think my 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 previous math brain was trying to like break it down that way, but it was just that 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 background switch that's happening between the data space and the aesthetic space. So that that clarifies that quite a bit for me. Um. So when you look at this, surprisingly, access and legends are the same type of thing, but um, to kind of summarize this, both of these are going to have, um, you know, they have the same purpose, but they allow you to read observations from the plot and map them back to the original values. And so there are commonalities between the two. So we might have specific arguments like names, breaks, and labels, and those transcend to different components of the access and legend. So it shared this graphic here to give us a representation of the different elements within an access and legend. Obviously you have an, an access, whether that be the X or Y axis, and most of the plots that we're creating are gonna be, gonna be two dimensional. So they're gonna have two axes. You're gonna have in the axis, you're gonna have the axis label, and then you're gonna have the actual physical space of the axis. Inside of the axis too, you might have a tick mark and label. And then when you talk about the legend, you might have components like the legend title and then things like the key label and there are certain functions that you can use to modify the different elements within each of these so if we want to apply a different scale like say we want to create we want to transform it into a square root scale or a log base scale or something like that we can do that with some function if we want to modify things here in the legend like the legend title which is a really straightforward one there's a function to do that. Um, there's also some other conventions that, you know, there's some convenience functions that we're probably familiar with that helps us change this, but we can use the actual like scale function to modify these elements. And one of the examples that I'm gonna share, share with you today within the key is I'm gonna show you how to actually write your own function to modify the key glyph in here. So you have some different, um, presets, but there is a blog post that I came across that you can actually define your own and we'll put smiley faces in here. So hopefully by the end of that, you'll kind of see how that kind of works. Um, so the book talks a little bit more. The other thing that I really disliked about this chapter too, is it would say a certain thing, but then it would push you to a different section. It's like, hey, we're going to talk about this thing, but really what you should go look at is you should go look at chapter 15 or, hey, you should go back to chapter 11. And so I think there was probably a more a better opportunity to like maybe flush some of these ideas out more or provide a little bit more context rather than saying like, hey, go look at this section that you're going to read in the future, but we're going to talk about it right now. So I don't know. I, I don't want to bag on the writing of this, but I think parts of this chapter definitely could have been um, uh, rewritten to be a little bit more clear. But when it comes to legends, legends are a little bit more complicated than axes. So with a legend, you can display multiple aesthetics, right? It can represent um, data represented or representing using the color aesthetic, the shape aesthetic, so on and so forth, different symbols. Also, the other thing, axes also always appear in the same place, but you can modify to move the legend wherever you basically want within the plot. So you need to have some global way to help you position them. And there's more details that can be tweaked. And we talked a little bit about pointing out some of the visual elements in here, but say you wanna make your, your key labels and your actual key horizontal. Say you want to um, make the key bigger, or even like I said, even if you wanna modify the specific key glyph that gets used in this, you have that flexibility to do that. Um, but because it's that of those aspects, there's some differences between the legends and axes. So an important thing that gets discussed in here is the scale specification. So um, you got to remember that every single aesthetic that we apply in our ggplot code is going to be also applied to some type of scaling function. So basically this is our first example and we've all seen this data set before we've seen mpg we've seen the scatter plot that it creates with displacement and highway mileage um and we see that we technically have three aesthetics here so we're mapping the x the y and the color aesthetic and because of that technically in the background ggplot is applying these different scale functions based on the type of data that we have and so we have scale X continuous, scale Y continuous, and scale color discrete. 
Um, the book talks a little bit more about how these functions are actually named, and I'm sure we'll probably get to that conversation here. But all of the scale functions follow this basic convention. They all start with scale. They start with the specific aesthetic and then the different types or the different data type that you might have. I looked at the documentation. There is a wide range of scale functions that are out there that you can use. There is an exercise in here, too, that asks you what happens if you mix, if you have like a continuous data, but you use discrete. Um, you can't do that. And ggplot's really good about having an error if you accidentally mix up. So if displacement was actually a discrete variable and you did scale x discrete, it would push an error for that. So the other kind of concept that gets discussed about um, with this is um, we can change elements of our scale in these functions, right? So if we wanted to label the x and y um, axes, we could pass a string into this name argument. I first looked at this and I said, and the book addresses this right away is, well, why would you do this? Because you have the convenience function labs to change this. But I think it's just showing this concept that these different parameters that are based on the scale can get passed along <clears throat> into um, different parts of the ggplot2 code. And so um, that convenient function labs might wrap this all together, but technically what's happening is it's still passing it into like a scale X continuous, scale Y continuous, or a scale function to actually modify that parameter. Then the book talks about, about the precedence rule that it has for if you accidentally or include two different types of scale functions. So in this case, what it will do is it will take this as precedence, the last thing that the last scale function that gets put out there, but um, it will push a warning. So you will see a warning. And I was looking at it the other day, or I was looking at it last night. The warning isn't really very explicit. It doesn't have like a warning attached to it. It's actually very subtle. So you got to keep an eye out for it. Um, I don't, well, I shouldn't say I don't see myself doing this very often, but um, it just be aware that of this precedence rule. And if you accidentally do have this situation, it's going to push a warning. Um, it's not going to push an error, but it's just going to push a warning. And this example here is just showing that these two things are equivalent. Um, and then obviously we have, we can go as far as not only just like changing like the labels, but if we want to do like a full change of or transform the actual X and Y to a different scale itself. So if we want to go from what it's represented into a square root transformation or a um, log transformation or whatever transformation you can probably think of, there are specific functions that will change the entire scaling. So a good example of this would be, and I'll share this here in a second, is sometimes you might be doing wanting to do like a log transformation. There's a scale X log base 10 log transformation that you can put and it will transform the scale for you. Many people are familiar with that um, function, but I've used that quite a few times. Um, but you have the full flexibility to like use just an entire function that just changes the entire axis. Um, I'm trying to see if I have that example up. And I think I do. So um, I kind of did this a little bit to kind of expand a little bit on the um, discussion that we were having. And here's some examples that I put together and I used a different data set. Um, I'm using the diamonds data set. I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but it's just um, different data associated with diamonds. So clarity, depth, table, price, um, carrot. I'm going to look at carrot. I'm going to look at price. And I'm also going to look at, I think, um, color, I think, or cut is what I'm going to look at. Carrot is just going to be the size of the diamond. Price is, should be intuitive. It's going to be price. And then um, I think I go with color. Color is like a representation of the actual color of the diamond itself. It has its own like specification, but you can look at it. But here's the scatter plot itself. I'm just doing genome point. Here it is. Um, this data set has a lot of data in it, so it's definitely got a lot of overlap. But you can see that I'm doing the same thing with scale X continuous, scale Y continuous. But then because I'm using, uh, I'm mapping color to color, and it's actually a discrete variable, I can use scale color discrete to change it. Now, if I wanted to modify, and there you go, just changed it here. 
if I wanted to modify the scale, say, of caret, instead of being what it is represented now, I could represent it into like a log. I could do that here, right? And in addition to this, and we talked about this last week, as I can change different parameters inside of the scale here. So instead of being, um, I think it starts with divergent, or no, it starts with sequential as the default. You can change it to um, qualitative to make it different. So here you go, it's gonna change it. Big thing to notice here is the scale log 10. It just changed, the, it just transformed this now into a log rather than um, what it was originally represented as. And so, and I do see some people, do see some people saying some stuff in the chat. So I'll double make sure that I'm covering that. Oh, oh where's my chat? I can't maybe see the chat. Should, we should maybe just speak if it's important because there's only three of us. Yeah. I think you can yeah. safely assume that the chat is just extra stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah, I can't open it for some reason right now. Oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, thanks, Gabby, for adding some stuff in it. Yeah, if you do have anything important to say. Um, yeah, that is a good point that this is pretty much just kind of reviewing the same stuff that's in Chapter 10. So I almost just question if this chapter is important. There are some a couple things that are kind of important in here. but um, well, Maybe they are rewriting reading the book and then they don't know how to how to mix the two chapters and maybe at one point they're gonna just merge them because it's it's essentially the same thing only this yeah, is using yeah. a different example diamonds yeah i'm just using the different example diamonds to kind of emphasize some of the things that get talked about in it i did there is a so if you go into the github repo there is a um there is a proposal doc in there for the third edition. And so I'm not sure if we're reading the second or third edition, but I was looking at it. I think they might be getting rid of this chapter based on that, but I'm not sure where that document was referring to or if it's being used or whatever. So didn't um, you say something like um, at, at the beginning of your, in, in your intro to this chapter, you said something about how this chapter would cover like how you can use scales to go beyond position I didn't quite understand what was meant by that, but then like in the chapter that Gabby presented it was position and scales. So maybe they were trying to divide it up, but I agree that it would make more sense to have it combined. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do not have the answer to that question. <laughs> um, I wish I could have dived a little bit more into um, some of the basic concepts in it. But yeah, I do agree with you that I think this could probably com be combined for sure. But Gabby, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. All right, cool. Uh, we already talked about the naming scheme, so I don't need to talk about that now. Um, there's also the discussion about fundamental scale types. So um, this is just based on the type of data that you're working with, or if you want to transform it into something. And so I did play around a little bit with bin scales, but obviously you have scales for continuous variables, scales for discrete data. And if you want to change your continuous into bin, or if you already have bin data, you can do that as well. Um, they talk about constructor functions and that most of these get passed to constructor functions, but it does preface it by saying, hey, know about these, but you will probably never use them. So I don't necessarily think we need to talk about them, but just be aware that there are specific, well, I mean, if you decide to extend ggplot2 or write your own package or something like that, you might be one aware of it, but just know that there's constructor functions that are available to this. The other thing that I'm starting to learn about ggplot2 is when I was kind of digging, especially when I was looking at the key glyphs, so I'm kind of jumping here a little bit, is a lot of it's like nested. So a lot of the documentation you have to go through like two or three different layers before you get your answer. And so like when I was looking at the key glyphs thing, because I wanted to learn more about it, I had to go to like, look at this function and then it references you to another function. And then it's like, go look at another function. And then you finally get your answer to what you're looking for. And so, I don't know, that's just, I think a design thing about like how ggplot is, but some of the documentation makes you bounce around to actually find the answer that you're looking for. So. Um, I'm definitely learning that a little bit more about if you're trying to find like the specific answers, how, how things work, you have to kind of bounce it around. And here's the same thing, like things are getting sent to a constructor function, but you might have to read more about the constructor function to know what it's doing. Anyways, that was kind of a sidebar, but just an observation. 
Um, so there was a discussion about scale breaks. Um, you know, it talks about the, what unifies the concepts of breaks across continuous discrete and bin scales. Um, this is getting at like the different data values that you have. And again, the book says this is a section that needs additional detail about break functions. So I really can't talk more about it outside of the book was not really clear about it. Um, the book did talk about scale limits. Um, I'm going to kind of skip in the notes here because some of it's just the same copy and paste from what the book was. But what I do have an example to kind of share with this. And I do have an example that I think where this might be used. But really what the book kind of talks about is when you have different scale functions, you can create certain limits to affect what happens within certain limits. And what you can do is you can have it do what it is like, you know, like we have like a continuous scale here, we can have some type of gradient. But if we wanted to, what we could do is we could create a limit where if the continuous scale hits a specific limit, it will treat values past that as NAs. And so since it's NA, there will be no fill or color applied to these, to these bars. And there's this discussion about this OOB squish, which allows you to say like, okay, if you hit this specific limit, then continue the color for the rest of them. Okay. And I was thinking about, I was like, where would I, where would I use this? And so what I try to do, and again, this is a half-baked example, so you know, just bear with me here. Um, I was thinking about this. Yeah, OB squish cracks me up. It sounds like, yeah, exactly. Um, so I was kind of thinking about this, and I'll just kind of share the example that I have with the with this. Is I was thinking about something like, um, say for some reason you were looking at some data and you had some like ceiling effect that you wanted to highlight. You were saying like, okay, if something hits like the certain point, these points don't matter. And so what you might do is you might set some limits here. And I'm thinking like the sale price. So say I'm somebody that is, you know, I'm a diamond dealer or something. I don't know. Um, I know that industry is not a great industry to be in, but say I'm working with people and I'm saying like, we cannot afford diamonds above $10,000. Okay. Well, then what I can do is I can say like, okay, let's put this line here make a representation here and anything over $10,000. Um, we don't look at, I don't know that I, I was, I, I'm trying to pull examples out that may not necessarily work, but. Um, I actually have a real life example of this surprisingly. Great. Um, yeah. It's, it's not, I did not use the scale function to do it, but now because I didn't realize I could, I, I did it manually by converting some values to NA. But um, so I am looking at vulture, arrivals at at dead animals uh for their feeding behavior and um i wanted to so i i have recorded lat long coordinates where these vultures are being provisioned with carcasses by a nature conservation agency and so i have car i have um coordinates where they say the carcass was placed and i wasn't mm. sure how accurate those coordinates were but they're pretty accurate and then i have locations of recorded feeding events where like there was a tag on the vulture recording its behavior and so i plotted all of these on like an xy coordinate plane where i had a little star to represent the carcass location and then i had a point for each feeding event that the vulture undertook and i wanted to color code those feeding events by distance away from the carcass mm. um, but i wanted anything beyond like 750 meters or 500 meters or something to just be gray because if i had because like i wanted to actually be able to visually distinguish the colors in the close distances and if i had included the points that were like super far away everything would have just been basically all on one end of the color scale um and you wouldn't get enough spread within the color scale to actually see the difference between a point that was like 50 meters away versus 200 meters away so i like I think I set some, I forget how I did it, but I did some complicated NA situation where I forced everything to be gray or I set the limits of the color scale um, so that it would only color points up to 500 meters. And it worked really well, but now I'm realizing I could have done it this way. 
Yeah, that's 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 a great point. And when you're when you were just discussing that, I mean, this might be useful in mapping, right? Like, say, I don't know, I don't do any of this work, but like, say, you have a specific region on your map, and you want to say, like, anything outside of this region, we're going to show the data, but we're not going to represent anything for that specific space. So, I think that's a really cool application of it. Um, <laughs> I do want to point out that I, I did not say I was a diamond dealer. I said think if I was a diamond dealer, um, <laughs> Kathy. So uh, unfortunately, I am not in the industry. And I know that industry is rife with uh, corruption. And uh, I do not want to be in an industry. So um, yeah, so let's see. Um, let's see. Okay, so the other so then say if I wanted to keep treat these color like say I wanted to do this like instead of treating it as NAs I want to treat it all as the same color so it hits this certain point treat them all the same color I just use this OBBB scale squish um, and it takes a little bit because this is a lot of data but like you can see like once it hits ten thousand dollars all of these points get treated as uh, the same color so and you can kind of see what's nice too is the scale actually um, well, I guess this is, doesn't really represent, represent this as well as I thought it would, because we have diamonds that go above 10,000, but you can kind of see that the scale here stops at 10,000, which is my limit that I've created. Um, what other examples do I have here? Oh, so the other thing that I tried playing with and somebody, and maybe Gabby, you can, or Kaya, you can explain this a little bit more because it sounds like this is some of the work that you do. I was playing around with this idea of maybe like changing the shape based on a limit. Um, so my thought was, and this is not, and with the limited time that I had, this is what I was thinking. Um, what I wanted to do was I got the limit to work where at a certain limit, it would just change it into a different shape. But what I was thinking is, is how could we modify this to be a specific shape? So if it hits a limit, could I make these like all little X's is what I was thinking. I couldn't figure that out, but I don't know. Just the, way that I can, the only way I can think to do it would be to add scale shape manual and then add the values, um, a list of values. And you would just have to have like, uh, you know, one of the values be the X and the other ones be something different, but there might be a more elegant way to do it in a threshold way instead of a categorical way. And I'm not sure how to do that. Yeah, and it's really challenging because sale price is actually a continuous variable. And so you have to use scale shape bind. Or no, if you want to do this, like to change this into like actual separate like shapes, you have to bin it so you can create it into some type of categorical variable. And then it actually converts it like this. And I also found out for some reason, again, this is like, again, a half-baked example. So if I'm doing this wrong, somebody let me know. You can't set it at 10,000, but if you set it at 5,000, it will create the limit at 10,000 and any values above that will change it into its own like single shape. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a half-baked idea. I thought I could do it, but then it was like, eh, I don't know these scale functions as well as I should. So, but maybe scale, scale, uh, scale shape manual might be a place to explore. So yeah, the other thing is, that um, ggplot works in layers. So the first thing that you put, that's the first thing that it does, and then it works on top of that. So if you do the, the shape before, and then you color gradient, maybe, but it depends on what exactly you want to do, because it will add things on top of what you already have. So if you have the shape after the color gradient, it's going to color gradient it first, and then add the shapes. So maybe... Mm -hmm reversing them too. And I would go with the color manual too. Um, all the manual functions, the shape manuals or something. Yeah. Yeah, I can try that real quick here and then just see if that does something different. Um, Remove the final shape. plus, yeah, there you go. Um, but if not the manual one. Mm, it still uh, looks the same. Yeah, this one's, huh. Yeah, and I don't I don't want to take our time like just um, stumbling around trying to figure out scale, uh, scale shape manual. But for people watching in the future, it might be something to explore. If you're interested in my thought process of like changing these to something a, a completely custom uh, shape, so 
Okay, let's go back to this here. We have that. We talked about that. So we talked about the other thing, Colin. Sorry, real quick. Just yeah, go ahead. also post the example in Slack, and then maybe yeah. we can sort of think about it a little bit more and then put the solution there in Slack. Because sometimes I need like 10 minutes to think about something. I can't like work on it like in immediately. So yeah, I don't know. It would be a nice exercise. Yeah, absolutely. I could probably put like a reprex together and probably simplify it because diamonds is a lot of data. And so that it might be confusing. So I could probably like simplify it some more and be like, how would somebody do this using scale functions? So um, again, I, the notes, a lot of these were copy and pasted from the book. So I don't feel like I should be reading to the group, but um, it talks about scale guides. I didn't necessarily fully understand this, but basically the way I understood it was you have different scale types and you have a default guide type. And these are the different guide types that are available for the scale type that you have. And so each of these guide types, they say, and this is the other thing that confused me too, they said has appeared earlier in the toolbox but I don't remember them talking about the toolbox. Are we just talking about like scales in and of itself? Or is there something that I'm just missing with it? They said toolbox a yeah. couple of times. And I'm like, I don't remember what you were talking about. But anyway, so I shouldn't, I'm not bashing the, the, the authors. I'm just saying this was confusing for me. Um, but basically, yeah. So they talked about this earlier, you know, um, there's different, um, each of these guide types are available. So for like color bar, color steps, access, legend, and bins. Um, and they get talked about in these previous sections that they kind of point you to talk about. But um, also inside of these functions, there are different arguments that are available to change these. And so I feel like I didn't do this section very good justice. So if anybody wants to add clarification or correct me, please let me know. Or commiserate with my <laughs> lack of understanding. <laughs> Did anybody else understand this in depth? So I think the guides, the way, I don't, I don't know if I fully understand guides, but the way I have sort of like made it up in my mind is that they control the appearance of legends and movies. so it's more like how they control the visual representation of the scale where the scale mm -hmm. controls exactly like the numbers and if you're going to have it in logarithm or um you know uh squared root or whatever it is that you're going to do numerically to the scale mm -hmm. that's what you control with scale but the guides control the, the aesthetics, if you will, like the visual representation. I feel like that's, oh, that's, good, that's yeah. sort of like how I do it. Yeah. I don't know, but I, I may be wrong. Because if you see there, default guide type, mm -hmm. color, and, and yeah. I I think you're spot on. I, I think you're spot on for my understanding. Um I think they tweak it a little bit because if you read there, it says these arguments to these functions offer additional fine control. So it's like, yeah, you're tweaking it a little bit more. So it's yeah, like so, a, an accessory to the scales. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think the missing piece that I have here is what I'm missing is, is that we've made the transition from like the access to the actual legend because the legend is going to have different aspects of the guide and you can modify those different aspects using these guide color bar color step access so on and so forth is that what is that is that a piece that i was missing yeah because um with guides you can also control for example what title you're using so it's like once you already did like the scale um logarithm or scale, whatever it is that you did with the scale, then mm -hmm. you can customize it a little bit more or tweak it a little bit more, but mo modifying the title, modifying the color or something. So it's mm -hmm. like 
taking that scale and moving it a little bit beyond, I think. Um, I think. Um, but I think I agree that this is not explained well in the book. I think that this guide part, they, they explain scales really, really well, but it's like, what is the difference between scales and guides? And they use it in previous chapters, like it says they are section 11, 4, 2, blah, blah. But it's like, why do I need the guides if I already have the scales? Like they don't really explain that. So this is a little bit of like how I am in intuitively thinking about the guides. So let's hope that that's good. We can also open that um, and a question in the Slack, like the uh, help section, and then see what other people can can explain. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I understand writing a book is challenging. So I'm definitely not providing criticism for people on this because this is already a complex topic. Um, but yeah, if anybody for, who's writing the book is is watching this, this is a little confusing still for me, but um, and sounds like for other people as well. Um, let's talk about scale transformation. Um, you know, there are, we talked a little bit about the scale transformation already. Um, when we looked at, you know, changing the original representation to square root, changing it to log base 10, uh, or changing it to log or whatever we need to do. Um, it uses this example to kind of talk a little bit about this. And there's this example about like how you can modify the scale to emphasize different components of it. These density plots are still kind of, um, uh, still are kind of hard for me to kind of understand and wrap my mind around. But changing the scaling of this will change like how the data is actually being represented. And in this case, it highlights the distribution differently if you modify the scaling. And so you can see that here, those scale functions that we apply, here's the original representation. But if we change it, we can see that we get a different like view of the actual distribution rather than being this representation. Again, this is outside of my area and the visualizations that I create, but I, the takeaway that I had is it's just modifying the scale or how it's actually scaled is going to emphasize different components of the data that you have available to you and you have that functional, functionality available to you if you need it. Colin, <clears throat> Colin, do you have the code for those plots mm -hmm. easily accessible or not really? Yes, I do. Let me open up another. I just wanted to see what, what the code they were they used was to actually do that transformation. Absolutely. Let me open up another version of R here. Thanks. Open up another window. Yeah, I think like what they did there was like they didn't change the X and Y axes. It's not like the X was on a log scale or something because you could see that the pixels weren't different shape or anything like that. But the mm -hmm. colors, the color mapping itself was done nonlinearly, which I can understand why that's useful. I can also see you'd have to be pretty careful to be very clear that you colored it that way because it could subtly affect people's understanding without them realizing that it's abnormal. Let's go to the book club. Let's go to the book. No, let's go to the actual book itself. I think that will help us look at this specific example. Yeah. Um, just give me a second. I'm switching the project here. Yeah, if it takes too much of a pain, don't worry about it. I can I can go back and check myself. No, it's good. I think this is it's good to talk about this stuff. So um Source, give me the source, give me the source. I will also highlight for you too, if you've dug in if you've dug into the source of the book, they actually have these um they actually have these notes in here that talk about like <laughs> different things. And oh, in wow, fact, okay. there is a there is a um there's a, a completely other section that is not included <laughs> um that they wrote about it. Um that I was because I usually like to read the source book a little bit because then I can kind of see like other notes in here. But there's like a, a uh, I'm not gonna scroll you to death, but um you can see some of these like author notes where they're basically like, maybe we shouldn't include this, maybe we should include this. So yeah, it's definitely a work in progress. But your specific question was looking at uh oh this one right here. So oh trans equals square root. Okay, okay, cool. So they they used scale fill continuous and they either transformed it or didn't. Yeah, that seems, I mean, that's sneaky. I think it's just important to be really clear about what transformation you've applied to the color um, because that is likely to not be intuitive for your audience. And also I think people are really used to seeing 
a transformation of the axis. Like if you say the X axis is on a log scale, people sort of understand what that means. But if you say the mm -hmm. color was applied on a log scale, I think people are more likely to like not really grok what that is about. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to clarify. Oh, absolutely. And I will tell you, like when I think about the audience of the visualizations that I create, like doing a log base scale in and of itself yeah. is probably like, a bridge too far for some people sure, and so sure. more scientific audience for sure would make sense to it so um but while you were talking i was thinking about the other thing that i get that i think gets emphasized here as well is you don't necessarily have to do the transformation like scale something log 10 you can actually do the transformation using an argument so if you mm -hmm. wanted to do that you could do that. I think that was what it was also emphasizing is that the functionality is also built in the parameters, not just functions in themselves. So. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think that clarified that up quite a bit. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? So go back to the notes. Oh, um, and then it talks about like changing the size aesthetics and we can actually look at the code for this here in a second, but here we have a specific variable Z. So it's just an example data set. I think it has an X, Y, and Z. And what it does is it maps Z or it maps Z onto the size aesthetic. And there are certain parameters that you can use to change the representation. One of them that I'll show here in a second is you can actually reverse the representation. So rather than being from small to big, you can go big to small. They did have this conversation about how this represents like weight versus distance. I did not understand that at all. Um, but I mean, we can talk more about it if somebody understood it better than I did, but they said like reversing it in one way, it's represented as a weight. And then if you reverse it, it's represented as a distance. And yeah, that, that just didn't make any sense to me at all, but um, just, it could be my lack of understanding. Um, two book. Yeah. Let's look at this example here. So here's the example that we have. It, I think this is just highlighting another example that the functionality is built into the parameters and not just a function in itself. And so what you can do is you can use transformation reverse to reverse these actual representations. So um, I don't know. Does anybody else want to add anything to them to this? Here's the uh, here's the section that I was talking about. They have this quoted out, but they were, they were going to have a discussion about a bin transformation section, but then the next statement after that is, it's not a statement, but it's a question. Tempted to omit this entirely, question mark. So there's there's stuff that's written in here that is not in the book itself that you can actually look at a little bit more if you want to. But um, Let's see, go back to the notes. Oh, I think I had an example of this too when I was playing around with this. Sorry, I keep switching windows here. Um. But I wanted to play around with maybe transforming it to log 10. Um, I did also find out that TRNAS is being de is depreciated. And it's now the parameter's name is transform. So keep that in mind if you want to do a transformation in the scale. You have to use transform rather than TRANS. And so I noticed that in the documentation the other day. I was like, oh, this looks like the TRN and and S is uh, depreciated, so. But here's basically doing the transformation here. Um, and so you can see not really too much of a change. It just changes the scaling of the actual size of the bubbles, but here's the same example, but in reverse. So here they are in reverse. So this is gonna be a little bit more clear, but you can see now diamonds that are of higher price or smaller and as they get lesser in price, they get bigger. But in this case, I don't know why you would do this because that just doesn't make sense. So, um, okay, let's see, uh, going back to the book. There was some discussion about merging and splitting. Um, so there was this discussion about merging these things together. So if we wanted to, so how this code is, and I can share this with here in a second, but like we have these different aesthetics mapped onto these um, different points in the actual data space. But when the legend gets created, it doesn't include those actual 
like representation. So for us to do that, we have to merge different aesthetic mappings to our legend. And there's a special way to do that. Um, let's just go to the, let's just go to the book because um, I don't think the notes do do it justice here. Um, Translog, translog. Oh, this is all the bin stuff. Uh, fill text, fill color. So by Larry, personalize those map variable. Merging. Okay, here we go. Um, so here's the merging stuff that it was talking about. So here we have our toy data set that gets created uh, up here in the top. Um, so basically we have scale X continuous. And then what it's basically doing is if you add these different elements to an aesthetic, you have to merge them. And for you to actually merge them, you have to use the convenience function labs and name those specific aesthetic elements and give them a string name and name them the same to actually blend them together. Um, I tried to do this with this example here. And again, I'm sorry, I keep switching back. I tried to do that with this example right here. Where did I try and do this? There was an example where I tried to merge them, but I think it's up here. It's this one. So I tried to do it with this one, but it wouldn't let me merge it. So because we have a, skin a continuous scale sale price, or technically it's now binned because I binned it with shape bend, um, it wouldn't let me merge even if I did the labs. So even if I had the same sale price for the both of these, it wouldn't let me merge it. So I didn't really understand why that was the case. But I don't know if anybody has any insight on that, but basically you can, to reduce redundant information, you can merge these legends together. Um, but in my case, my example, I didn't get it to work. So, but anybody have any thoughts on this? I think the way I have done that to not have two legends, I think I've used a glyphs function. You just do plus glyphs something. And mm -hmm. then that's how I do it uh, manually a little bit. Uh, um, I have an example in my website. I'll see if I can unearth it and put it on the Slack. But yeah, the, there's a, let me see if there is something here in the documentation. So there are a yeah, bunch of, um, of ggplot. There are a bunch of glyphs functions or glyph, I don't remember. Oh, I don't know. If I find them, I'll, I'll put them under Slack because, um, yeah, I, I, I've never done that merging like that. But there are different ways of doing things. Yeah, I've also never done this. This is very advanced. Uh, it looks useful, but I'm confused. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm no, but it's very but useful. <laughs> but it's super useful because it's exactly when you have different legends. You don't want them necessarily. You want it right. to be like a triangle. It's darker blue the other the square is like a darker blue and blah blah so that you only like colin said reduce redundancy um so it's really useful um i remember the only workaround that i have is with glyphs and i have an example even on a on a workshop that i did a few months ago and i think that's how i did it with glyphs something glyphs underscore something yeah, so if anybody's watching this in the future, which I don't know how many people that's going to be, um, just know that you can do this, but you're going to have to do some more digging to figure it out because our group of very smart people here uh, can't figure this out. At least I can't. Um, I can't speak for the whole group, but for me, it was a struggle. But you can do it, and you have to just use scale functions to do it. So um then it also talks about splitting legends. I'm not going to go into this too much because one, the book says like, hey, you probably shouldn't do this or the general rule is not to do this. But, you know, for every rule, there's probably an exception. So you have to use this um, this package called GG New Scale. If you're looking at to doing this just for the sake of time, I'm not going to dig into it, but you can. You can split these scales if you have to, but um, I'm not going to spend the time talking about it rather than just point you to look at GG New Scale. That is how you should do it is use a package. All right, so this one was probably going to be the one takeaway that I'm going to take away from this entire chapter is key glyphs, um, other than maybe like scale transformations. But it's really interesting to see that there, 
there you can actually change the actual key glyph representation. So the example that it has is it's just looking at some economics data, the time series. Um, you can change this glyph and I don't think it's, yeah, it's in here. So how you can do this is you can actually like pass a string and let's just go over to the note or the actual book itself because that's a little bit more clear than me looking at that. Um, what we can do is in the actual geo mapping, there is an argument called key glyph and you can pass in different representations of this. So the example that the book was showing was um, time series and there's an actual time series string that you can pass into it. But in addition to that, there are functions that go with this. So instead of doing this string, we can do draw key time series and it will change the glyph in and of itself. And so going back to the example here, here's just like a line, but for time series, it's kind of like an upward trending line. So um, really kind of nice feature. This is probably gonna be the one takeaway that I'm gonna have from this. But before I open it up to any more questions, what's really interesting is because this is a function, what you can do is you can define your own function. And there is, it's linked in the chapter and I read this and Emil is just, Emil's a genius. Uh, if you ever read any of Emil's stuff, it's really, really good. Um, but he has this blog post that talks about how you can actually define your own function to create key glyphs using what's called a grob. And he walks you through how to actually make smiley face key glyphs. And I'm not going to walk through the code itself. You can read the actual blog post, but it was really interesting to see it. But that's what I did with um, my examples here is I actually went and defined my own function, draw key smile. And this is just a function. If you knew how to use the grobs and write this function. And all you have to do is, is you can pass this function into the key glyph argument of your aesthetic or your geome. And now, oh, let me run this here. We do all this. Oh, this is probably going to take a while, but I run this. But um, what it will do, and eh, yeah, we'll just let it run through. It's going to take a second because I ran the whole file. But basically, this is a function now, draw key smile, and it's going to use that to actually output smiles for the key glyph rather than using some of those presets. So um, while I wait for this to finish, does anybody else have any other comments that they want to add to this or any other? context or corrections. Oh, here we go. So there you go. Oh my god. I have a diamond data set with some smiley faces in them. So that's really cool. Uh, yep. This is not my idea. This was totally Emil's. And like I said, Emil's a genius when it comes to this design stuff in R. So any of his stuff is pretty much gold, but he shows you how to make your own little smileys in the key gloves. So Oh, if there's no other questions, I mean, yeah, thanks for hanging in there with me. Like I said, I struggled with this chapter mightily. Um, so if anybody's watching this in the future, I do apologize. If I got something wrong, please don't uh, don't send me hate email because this was a struggle for me. Um, but yeah, uh, anything else that anybody else wants to add? Tough chapter, but well explained. Thank you. Um, it's there's a lot to unpack here and it's if anything it's just like piqued my interest in doing more with scales because i feel like i barely touch them typically um but there's a lot that's possible yeah thank you colin and we that yeah like 20 what well, 30 there you go right on the on the hour so thank you so much for that explanation so we will reconvene next week. I don't think I'm going to be here next week. So um, next week we have Kaya guiding us through chapter 15. So you guys start without me because I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be at my conference. And then, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I will see you on Slack if anybody has any questions. And Colin, please post um, post on Slack all those examples, et cetera, and then maybe we can think about them uh, a little bit more so that we can figure what is. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to 